Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. I am truly delighted to have my friend and colleague Esther Perel join me for this first episode of Reimagining Love. Esther is a force of nature. She is a psychotherapist and author. You probably recognize her voice from her celebrated TED Talks, which have garnered more than 30 million views. Her best-selling books, Mating in Captivity and the State of Affairs, delve into topics of desire, infidelity, and sustaining mystery and excitement in long-term relationships. Esther and I have been friends for years now, and every time we connect, I leave our conversations feeling energized and inspired and so very proud to continue the work that we get to do in this field. One of Esther's many accomplishments is that she has built a training platform for therapists and coaches called Sessions. In conjunction with this platform, she hosts an annual conference called Sessions Live. This is an event for therapists, coaches, and other professionals working in the field of relationships and well-being. I am really excited to be presenting at this year's virtual conference, which is actually going to be my third year teaching at Sessions Live. We will share more about the event and how you can attend later in the show. In this episode, we explore a listener question that highlights so many of the struggles of modern relationships, particularly in this not-so-post-pandemic era. Esther and I discuss the challenges and the importance of reimagining boundaries, rituals, and desire in times of crisis, and how this listener, and in fact all of us, might re-enter our closest relationships with newfound curiosity and creativity, even in these most trying of times. Hello, Esther. Hello, hello. (laughs) So nice to be here. It is a treat to have you here. It's so nice to be with you. Okay, I want to start by telling you and telling all the listeners my favorite Esther Perel story, if I may Ooh. indulge. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> What's coming next? <laughs> That's right. And then you will tell me if you even remember this. So it was the summer of 2017, and you and I were biking in lower Manhattan late at night, like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, chatting away, and about 30 yards ahead of us, a biker... And a skateboarder smashed into each other. And I gasped and you exclaimed, likely in one of the nine languages that you (laughs) speak, you exclaimed something because it was quite a shocking sight. And we biked over. They're both on the ground and the biker gets up quickly and he starts to kind of dust off his bike and he's ready to ride away. And you say, wait a minute, none of us are going to leave until we make sure that all of us are okay. And these two guys who were like maybe in their 20s became 10-year-olds in the blink of an eye and they both look at the ground and they're digging their feet, but it's his fault. No, it's his fault. And then you said, this is not about fault. This is about making sure that everyone is okay. And then the biker helped the skateboarder up and we took a few moments and off they went (laughs) and then off we went. Our friend Terry Real says, that in patriarchy, you get to be either powerful or connected. And it was just another example of what I so admire about you is that you just live in both, right? Powerful and connected. It was such a beautiful experience to see you navigate. (laughs) I had forgotten it, but when you started telling it, it all came back. What a lovely story to be reminded of. I like when I feel like, oh, what a wise choice I did at that time. Like, 
I can look back and not feel, oh, I wish I had done something else. I actually feel like I did the right thing in the moment. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And I remember the biking. Yes, I do. I remember biking together, running together. I mean, we've actually hung in beautiful ways here and in Chicago, being at your house. There are friends and there are colleagues. And then there is this very small group that are collegial friends with whom you share the friendship, but you also share the working together and the unique bond that clinicians and people who are interested in the same topics have together, like the first time when we met at a networker. And I don't have many people with whom I'm at the same time really connected professionally and I can call and ask and say, what do you think about this? How do you understand that? What have you noticed? And then also go and run with them or bike. That's right. Or dance. My gosh, we danced at sunset with the Statue of Liberty in the <laughs> background. Right. Magnificent. <laughs> yes, but you're right. Our work is generally so private, right? It happens behind closed doors and now it happens on Zoom screens. And we need to be careful and thoughtful and boundaried when and how we share our work experiences. But you're right, to have those colleagues that you can just turn to, especially at a time like this, where our whole way of working has been upended and to just like level set, to kind of tune our instruments together. Like, how are you doing and how am I doing and how are you perceiving this? You're right. Yep. I, I, I hold you in that very same space. Work and play. Work and play. <laughs> <laughs> I ask every expert friend, friend experts that I have had and will have on Reimagining Love, the same question to kind of enter the space together. And I am really eager to ask you this question, which is, I would love to hear about a growing edge that you are currently working on in one of your important relationships and what that growing edge has been teaching you lately. I think one growing edge is in my conversation with my two sons about their careers, about their work trajectories, about the fact that we are all together for the first time in 10 years, all four, and they are asking questions about what do they want to do and what matters and what do we expect from our work life, etc. And I realized that what worked for us and the way we went about it is probably not the way things are going henceforward. So it's very interesting. It's more asking questions and more sometimes sharing just of, you think I don't have things I don't like to do or things that don't in interest me. I mean, it's so different as a clinician. We are really blessed in many ways to think, I don't spend my time questioning the purpose of my work. I don't have to say, if this company ceased to exist, would I care? <laughs> It's like, yes, I would. It's a very interesting thing to suddenly be a parent to young adults who are in the first years of their professional lives and to realize that one of the big, big changes that's happening that already started with the advances of tech and then have been spearheaded in 10 years into 18 months since the pandemic took over and realize that I don't have good advice. <laughs> I have advice, but I don't know if it's advice for the moment. That's right. And I imagine what each of your sons feels in those conversations is at least your steady, attuned presence. It's a really what you just have shared about your own relationship with the boys lands so deeply for people because I think it means that you've had to abandon to whatever degree you had, this sort of authoritative, you know, top-down notion of as a parent, I know, and as a parent, you should, which so many people continue to have that model because they grew up with it and they believe it's right. And it's hard developmentally as your kids become adults. We do need to learn how to move to the sidelines and be like the book on the shelf that gets pulled off the shelf as a resource as needed, then put back on the shelf. But what you're speaking to is there's like another iteration of that, which is also they are entering the world of work in a time when the world of work is changing. So whatever you might have said to them a few years ago, it needs to be reframed and rerun through this new lens of work in a pandemic. But the thing that they have with both you and I'm sure with Jack is that you will be there and you will listen and you'll just be in the muck with them, kind of sorting through and reminding them what you know to be true of them. Add another growing edge to this. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting, culturally speaking. So one just came back after being away literally for 10 years and one um, is in transition through us. And when I came to America, I came from 
Belgium via Israel. And I came from countries where kids staying home while they are in college is common. Kids coming back home until they begin their own personal lives was common. When I came to America, the idea that your kid could come back home after college was seen as a truncated independence. Like you've launched them and if they come back, it means that the launch is unsuccessful, which I never really believed. But I did absorb some of this push towards a certain definition of the word independence, of course. And it's very freeing to actually realize that I don't have to hold by this concept. My growing edge here is to really say this is not a value that I necessarily need to adhere to. And I don't have to justify. I remember seeing many parents justifying why their children back were living with them kind of thing. Of course, the pandemic gave permission for that. But now there's a sense that it needs to go back to the old norms. And I think that one of the big pieces of the great adaptation of this moment is that the norms that stood steady and that are often highly individualistic norms, very silo-driven ways of living may be coming to an end or at least a big reset. That's right. And it means then that once you drop the story of it's happening because of like all of that rationalization, which of course the emerging adult feels and they hear their parents telling a story that's the excuse or the context of why this happened, which then amplifies and reiterates a sense of shame or failure. So without all that, it's just we're home and we're together and this is the next step. And and then you get to have all the goodies of that, right? All the beautiful, sweet moments that happen when you are under the same roof without that kind of shroud of it shouldn't be this way. I love that you then get to anchor back into something that you know and have known, which is that was never, that was never your value anyways. And so there's no need to say anything besides this is what it is. And this is the step in their journey and in our journey. It's beautiful. I also grew up working in my parents' store. From the moment I could talk, I was asked to come downstairs and help. So this idea that the enterprise was the family and it wasn't the parents were the producers and the children are the consumers. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is what's happening at this moment too. And they're involved, they help, we have a project, they're taking over that project. I mean, we are really participating in this enterprise called the life of the family. And it's not we are the producers and they are the consumers. I know that many communities live like this in this country. Mm -hmm but they're not necessarily considered the norm. <laughs> that is a thing that I would like to challenge and offer a growing edge to others about, is to ask more from our kids so that they actually are not just on the receiving end, economic drains, but they become part of the economic asset, part of the shared responsibility of the things that need to be taken care of. And that's beyond having interesting conversations with the kids. They really are part of the instrumentality of the family. It's another layer, like a deepened layer of the profound interdependence. That means it goes in both directions. That means it goes at all levels. And that is certainly something that this great adaptation has brought to us is like in our faces again and again, what you do and what I do affect each other. And we're all part of the big ecosystem of our community and our culture and our nation. And then the small ecosystem of the family. Exactly. Exactly. So speaking of great adaptations, <laughs> you host every year this conference that I love. I love what you create because you create it from your heart and your spirit and your cultural locations. And it is a conference for not just therapists and coaches, but for everybody who is involved in work that is about relationships and relationality. And I want you to spend some time now talking about this year's theme. You do a beautiful job of creating these themes that offer opportunities for your faculty to show up with their gifts and their talents and their zones of genius, but also for your attendees to discover parts of themselves, to come away with new tools for their work, however that work looks. And this year, your theme is the great adaptation how therapists and clients can stay grounded when the ground is moving. The idea is this. We are living in a time of overlapping large societal crisis, 18 months of prolonged uncertainty. And an image that one of the guest faculties, Lisa Fortuna, talked about in one of her talks was after Storm Maria in Puerto Rico, that the children were talking about two different trees, the trees that fell, because they were straight 
and the trees that knew to bend and therefore could redress. And I thought this image is a beautiful image of resilience, of what it looks like to be flexible, to be nimble, to respond to the moment and to straddle new things and old things. So how do we ground ourselves at the moment when the ground itself is moving is about this. How do we continue to support other people when we ourselves are depleted? The burnout rate among practitioners is very, very high. How do we have something to give when our own family needs more from us? How do we create a sense of collective resilience with our colleagues and don't continue to think of resilience in this individualistic framework? How do we change, it? specifically now I'm talking to therapists, it's not just therapists, we are going through a parallel process than our own clients. We're going through the same things. I am talking to you from my bedroom. I am seeing patients from this little place. I'm absorbing stories and stories of suffering that are entering this room. And then I'm supposed to continue to think that it is just my bedroom. How does one do that? And what does that do to transparency and to boundaries and to self-disclosure? And then what is the role and the goal and the limitations of therapy when you're dealing with climate despair, with racial reckoning, economic upheavals, and massive changes in the work culture? So these are large societal issues that once again have become central characters in the process of therapy. It's bringing back the world in the conversations because these are not just issues that have to do with people's personal histories. Of course, the way they respond to some of this does. But as one of my students said, after an hour of hearing my patient talk about her house being burned, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I felt like saying we have this whole discussion about climate despair and, and I just wanted to say me too. <laughs> wasn't very helpful, you know? Right. <laughs> so what is therapy meant to do at this moment? How does it change what we can offer our interventions, how we straddle helping people with a sense of hopefulness as well as their own anxieties and don't individualize them and make this their own personal problem? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So sessions live of this year is the great adaptation. How can we stay grounded when the ground itself is moving? And we're looking at what is the adaptive therapist or practitioner? What does that involve at this moment? And then the second part of this is what is mass mutual reliance? What is a therapy and a life that is more organized around social connectivity? And then the third one is really what, what does it mean to be straddling hope in an age where there is quite a lot of despair going on and what is post-traumatic growth mm -hmm. so that we don't just talk about trauma without also talking about some of the strengths and resilience that can develop out of those experiences and make us even more able to withstand adversity and thrive again. So that's the arc of this conference and it's a virtual conference. We bring in the arts, we bring in a lot of participation and experiential things on the part of the people who join us. Last year, we had people from 41 different countries. So it's also very dynamic and straddles the challenges and the possibilities that virtual conferences are about. I remember a couple of years ago being at your conference and the day began with dance. It was hundreds mm -hmm. of us in a room doing a really a mindful connective dance. And I could feel the categories in my brain busting because I was there as faculty. So I had my PowerPoints and my notes <laughs> and my professional shoes. But then I also was in that space as a dancer, right? Shoes off, hips moving. And it was, I am my best clinical self, my best teaching self when I am in a space with all of me anyways. And that was perhaps a bit of a luxury a couple of years ago, but now in this time, it is mandatory, right? If we can't show up in a therapy session with the truth of our energy, the truth of the shared experience that what my client is going through, I'm experiencing some version of it, then we're not going to be fully present. So I love that this conference is about helping clinicians have permission to just name that. There's no way we can be okay all the time. There's no way we can have any of this figured out because we're in it together and we don't know what the next version or the next iteration of the pandemic is going to be. So our best and bravest work is our presence 
But what you are inviting us to do is figure out, okay, so what are the set of tools that you bring that help you be present? One of the things that informs your presence is, of course, how you are in your body. Mm -hmm. And so I will actually start one of the days with a somatic experience that, of course, I wish well, we could do in person because it's so much better to do it with others than to do it alone in front of your screen. But still, I will hope that people will not go to their kitchen <laughs> right. while this uh, happens. The other way that you bring in your presence is really everybody has history, stories. I think that's my centralized organizing principle from their family, from their community of facing adversity and then building resources in order mm -hmm. to be able to face that adversity. By the way, they were not always presented as resources. If you lived in an unsafe environment and you became vigilant, that vigilance is a resource that helped you live in that unsafe environment. It's not that people taught you to be vigilant, but out of all these experiences, resources come out as well. And these resources come with us to our work at this moment. I know for myself that I had not thought as much about the experience of my parents talking about their life in concentration camps during World War II yep. as much as I did when we went in lockdown. I thought, Barry, I actually did. I never called it lockdown. They never called it lockdown. They called it concentration camp. But basically, what was it? You know, and then I said, how did you wake up? What did you do? How did you stay hopeful? What did you do with the fear? What did you do with other people, etc.? And these stories began to be part of my resource pool, of my memory, my intergenerational memory. So everybody has stories like this. And to tap into that, and then the question is, to what extent do you share them with your patients or share slight pieces of it or just let it inform you? And how do you know discerning when it is wise to do what? That's, That's right. another version of being present. That's right. Absolutely. And I think sometimes if a, if a clinician finds themselves sharing too much or sharing with a kind of urgency, that becomes a blinking indicator on the therapist's screen that they need to be turning towards their colleagues. They need to be resourcing themselves with their colleagues. And I know that one of the things that you are hoping will come away from this conference is that we will all find ourselves within communities of colleagues. And I know I have a community of colleagues, couples therapists. We've been meeting monthly for gosh, almost 20 years. When the shit hit the fan, we were meeting weekly and all we were doing was checking in. How are you? How's your body? Are you eating? How's your sleep? We were really caretaking for each other. And I know that I carried those Sunday afternoon check-ins into my week then. It was an essential resource for me and has remained so. You know, UCSF did a mega survey recently and on burnout and mental health providers of all sorts scored on the top mm -hmm. of the burnout. And a part of it is if you go to the office, generally you come home and at least there is a delineation, a demarcation between going to work and coming back home and you hope that you can leave some of the stories at the office. That's gone. Then on top of it, sometimes you come home and other people can talk about what they did that day. We can't. So we have to keep all these secrets and we can't even vent a little bit or release a little bit and talk with the people around us about, you won't believe what I heard today, you won't believe what I saw today, or this is this stays with me, or I don't know what to do. Or I mean, And many, many, many of us are undersourced. We do not have supervision groups, consultation groups, support groups, people who care, who hold this with us. I think that it's essential. I did the same thing as you. We had a monthly group that became a three time a year long days, and then suddenly... We had to have one of our long days in March, March mm -hmm. 20th. And that day, of course, didn't happen. And so we all showed up. And then from that moment on, we met weekly for six months. And we talked more about ourselves than we ever had. We talked about what was going on in our own personal lives. And this is from Francis Weller's book on the raw edge of sorrow, where he talks about how grief in all cultures has been primarily addressed in collective settings, in groups where people sit together, bear witness, share the burden, and not where people sit alone in an office <laughs> mm -hmm. with closed doors and to, to talk to somebody. Our groups became these kind of ritualistic gatherings, yes. actually. They became grief collectives. Without naming it like that, that is what it was. 
we were suddenly talking about a world that was no more, a world that we didn't know where was it, it was going. We started to deal with BLM and racial reckoning in the group in a way that we never had before mm-hmm. and still are not way from done. We started to hear the actual realities of people, the person with the severe diabetes and the person with severe asthma and the children and the homeschooling and the sitting in the car to see the patients because they didn't have anywhere else to work. And suddenly the lives of the people became part of this group. This is a multidisciplinary group for so all schools. This is another mm-hmm. thing that's very, very important. And I think that there is a unique case study in this. I'm inviting some of the participants of the group to present at the Sessions Live conference this November because I think it is a unique example of we dealt with the suicide, we dealt with the issues of vaccinations. And yes. What does it look like when good consultation groups and collegial groups come together like that? And if Sessions Live can facilitate people meeting across continents at this point, doesn't matter, it will be my pleasure. I will really feel like we will have done something very, very important in this moment. You will have, and I think that that will happen. I think that is so, so, so important is that, right, that sort of collective sense that we may be alone in the moment when we are with a client, but we are not alone in this work and that we carry it uh, together. I think that therapists are often very isolated and lonely, actually, Mm -hmm. and give everything to their patients and then often go home and have nothing left to say and -hmm. nothing left to give. And this has been exacerbated. And that's part of why we need these different kinds of gatherings. It's almost more a gathering than a conference. Mm -hmm. It has all the trappings of a conference too, and it has all the CEUs, but it really is there to become something that is replenishing and nurturing as well as skill building And it's really for the therapist as well as it is for the work with the clients. That's right. And you're talking about the demarcations between the work day and the home day. Well, if there's only a doorway between my work world and my home world, I really do try to have reset. I use music. I use outside because otherwise I will be in a conversation with my husband or with our daughter. It's like they're like Charlie Brown's teacher, like wah, 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 because I'm not focused. I haven't closed up one world to open another world in the way that I would have on a commute or I would have by shutting down my office and moving home for the day. Without those little practices, and there are plenty of days I don't do those practices, but without those practices, we just stay in this constant state of, yeah, stir. There's just stir without anywhere to go, which I think a lot of what our listener the listener question that came in for us to talk about, I think that's what they're experiencing is just this constant state of upset of cortisol day to night, weekday to weekend, just kind of this languishing as Adam Grant calls it, right? This sense of like the days are bleeding together, the spaces are bleeding together. That wears on us, certainly. And it wears on us in month 18. We thought it was going to be like a really weird march, And here we are 18 months later, and we still don't quite know where Delta takes us, where the vaccines take us, like where we still don't know where we're going from here. We live generally in a world of speciality. We have boundaries, we have delineations, we have demarcations. We go to the gym, we go to the restaurant, we go to work, we go to see our parents, we go to see our friends, we change clothes, we take our racket. We have a ritual, a complete ritual that accompanies these activities that become signifiers of the transition from work to going out, to going to see friends, to going to exercise, to right now the collapse of those delineations, what you call the day, the night, the world, that collapse, it's so important to understand what it does to us, why we are exhausted. We're not just exhausted because we're sitting in front of the screen the whole day. That exhaustion is because There is a collapse of all the boundaries and what helps. And all the roles are happening in the same place without any geolocation. And I think what really helps in situations like this is the rituals. Like you're saying, I play music. I change clothes. I close my door. I leave my phone. I clean the table. I turn it from office and desk to dinner table. What is a ritual? It is a routine that is invested with intention so that it elevates it and it creates a symbolic meaning to it. Everybody knows that it is also your desk, but when you actually put the candles on it and the nice glasses, the ritual of setting the table transforms the desk into 
a dining table. And that gives it a new meaning so that when you sit at that table, you will act differently than when you're mm -hmm. sitting and thinking that you're eating at your desk. Mm -hmm. so you'll feel differently, you'll mm -hmm. sit differently, you'll have different conversations, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. It, I can't overemphasize this. Yes. It's really important for people to stay grounded. That is part of the grounding. That's right. We use space, we use physical objects to ground. I mean, yeah, that's right. Okay, let us do our listener question. She has written in to us from the UK, and she's asked us not to use her name, but here's what she writes. She says... My partner has been a real support to me during the pandemic. I have been so anxious about the virus, work, and family. We have been working and living together in a tiny flat. We have hardly been able to see family or friends. He is lovely to live with, but we don't have any personal space or variety. I have found it hard to find things for us to do together. I think our self-care has fallen off of a cliff's edge. I am struggling to remember better times before COVID. I love him, but I have started to question if I ever had the feeling of falling in love that people talk about. I should feel excited about the next stage of our lives, but I'm scared. I'm scared by the idea of being together and the idea of being apart. We are on a break because I feel so anxious. He is wonderful. I hate to have hurt him. I feel so ungrateful. I don't trust myself to decide if I want to take this relationship forward. How do I know what is COVID, what is us, and what is me? And how do I get clarity about what to do? It's a beautiful question from a woman who is trying really hard to be thoughtful, to be planful. I hear that she's being quite hard on herself about all of what feels, I mean, I have heard variations of this story so many times of, I don't know what I want. I don't feel good in, I don't feel good out. That relational ambivalence is such a common theme. And I was thinking about one of the things we don't know about her is, is her cultural locations. But it reminds me of what we were saying in the beginning of this highly individualistic model of the world. I think when one has experienced quite a bit of privilege or advantage, I'm thinking about around race, around financial security, there's a sense of like an assumptive world, right? That the world is kind of happening over there, but my intimate relationship happens over here. And so I get to have linearity, I get to have choice, and I get to have my love story kind of unfettered by the crises of the world around me. And so I don't know if part of her grief is that that's what she's also lost, the loss of this assumption that she could have a life that didn't have to do what your parents' life did, which was bend around a massive collective crisis and what so many people's lives have had to do, which is just bend with the crises of the world. What stands out to you about this question? Where would you want to go with it? I mean, I think, first of all, what you just highlighted is very interesting because if indeed I don't know if I feel flat because I just don't have those feelings for him or how much it is a result of having been in lockdown with him. I mean, how can you separate the two? <laughs> Life takes place in a context. And the context is that you may have been originally under the assumption that you know exactly how you feel because what you're feeling is separate from the big issues of the world. And right now you have just discovered that the big issues of the world are under your sheets. <laughs> and therefore, when you don't feel interested in him and you don't feel like you want to take care of yourself and you feel complacent and you feel like, what difference does it make? You suddenly wonder. So the interesting thing is that people who actually have lived with the big issues under their sheets are often much more intentionally invested in protecting their individual freedom whatever little bit they can control in light mm -hmm. of all the freedoms that have been taken from them. I did a lot of work early on with families under communism or just mm -hmm. coming out from communism and people fought for freedom. People fought for individuality. The, like makeup was one of the most important things of self-care, not because makeup, but because makeup was a way of marking individuality in a society where there was none. What is a freedom is different depending on what is taken away from you. Now, you've moved out. That's an interesting thing, I would say, that, as I listen to her. I also don't know how long you've been together. I also don't know anything about what he has felt. You're telling the story in first person plural as we, but you're the one that tells the story. You're the storyteller. And I would love to hear how your partner 
I think it's a he in this yes, instance, it is, right? Yes, it is. He's telling you the story too, because maybe you have a partner who tells the story of he has actually remained very engaged and wants mm-hmm. to reach out and you're not responsive or he went flat. And so as a result, you went flat and the more flat you went and the more flat he went and just each one reinforced the flatness of the other. That's another feedback loop. So how do you turn that around? You become very willful and intentional and premeditated. You don't hope for something to just come back from God knows where because it won't. You say, I'm going to make sure that we do certain things that bring us together around shared interest, around shared energy, around attention, around focus, around presence. Whichever version of it it takes, there's not a one size fits all. It may be related to nature, to food, to art, to physical activity, to intellectual pursuit, but it is about saying we need to reconnect. And how do we do that? What does it mean for us? Does it mean that we need to just take the time to say we're going to sit next to each other, experience each other's physical presence, put our hands on top of each other, not just watch a thing passively, but maybe watch a thing and then take a walk and talk about the thing we just watched, Mm -hmm. eat together and not just feed ourselves for sustenance, but really commune, congregate, do what people do around the table, which is the table brings us together to talk about 10 other things. Talk with curiosity. Part of What's interesting for me with this question to this person, I would say, I would love for you to play my game. That's right. I was thinking about that too. So where should we begin? A game of stories is my pandemic project where I really thought exactly that. I miss intimacy. I miss connection. I miss conversations around my table. I miss my friends. I miss having a form of engagement with my partner, etc., And I thought, I'm not alone. So I'm going to create an experience that is playful. And play, like all forms of play, is a container, a permission giver for boldness and risk-taking. In this instance, asking people to tell certain kinds of stories. You can play it in many different variations. And I would say, each of you pick 10 cards. They invite storytelling from each other. And see where that takes you so that you don't stay at the ground level. Take the elevator and go up and start looking and re-noticing things. So this is my game. You can do any other game. I just think this one is exactly with that in mind. Because you're sitting there and thinking, I just don't have that feeling. I don't know where, huh. And you do like this and you realize that (laughs) there is no pulse. And I'm saying (laughs) pulse comes from activity. Mm -hmm. The activity raises your heart rate. If you want your heart rate to go up, you need to do things that are going to stimulate it. If you're just sitting there and you're saying, I don't feel anything, you ain't Mm -hmm. going to feel anything. Mm -hmm. So I would work with you on how you can generate energy inside of you. How do you turn yourself on? How do you awaken yourself? How do you connect with your own aliveness? And then how do you also shut it down? Because if you shut it down, your partner can do all kinds of things and you won't be responsive. And we are going to work in very concrete ways, ways that you can be engaging and engaged. And then we will know if your relationship is responsive to it and is feeding off of it. It's like you crank it up and then finally the thing starts driving again. Well, then you know that the problem was here. If you Mm -hmm. crank it up and the thing still doesn't move, then maybe there is not enough flicker left to turn it into a flame, (laughs) but at least stimulate the flicker. That's right. And at least resist the urge that something must be wrong with us if we have to generate the flicker, right? Because that's another piece of it is like, we got this game. Okay, let's play a stairs game. Let's see what happens with this game. If that's the attitude of like, let's see what happens with this game of like, will this work? It's not going to work. I'm so glad you brought this up because otherwise everything is a test. That's right. And everything is a make it or break it. You're doing this because this is what happens because every relationship needs to resuscitate at some point. And then you can find out what made it lose air. But first of all, don't think of it as it's a sign of, it's a diagnostic sign of we are doomed. Right. She's used the word anxiety. So we have a bit of a clue of sort of the different roads that her mind is at risk of going down. She also goes down this road of, 
I love him, but I've started to question if I ever had the feeling of falling in love that people talk about. And so she's kind of like widening out to start to question the entire premise upon which this relationship was built. And so I would want to do just a little bit of psychoeducation with her as well and give her some permission to know that there are lots of entrees into a love story, right? Lots of first chapters of a love story. And some people do fall in love, but some of us step into love and it's no better and no worse. And so I worry about the way in which her anxiety is taking on a life of its own, perhaps, and saying, see, now I never even fell in love with him versus kind of anchoring on some of the knowns and some of the knowns. I love how she started. He has been a support to me during this time. Okay. So what is it about his steadiness, right? That really can feel anchoring, that feels like he can be that person for you. He's got your back. He's a man of his word, what he says he means, all of that, which there's a loveliness to that part of likely what drew her to him. And then as in every quality, there's the double-edged sword, right? So now perhaps she is really focusing on what comes along with somebody who's very reliable is perhaps he also can get kind of simple and dug in. And perhaps he may be quite a bit more comfortable in this simple, lots of days look the same because that's his energy, that's his personality. He can be really comfortable with the kind of simplicity. And that then she layers the story of, but if he's okay like that, it means we're doomed. It means there's nothing versus what about her taking the lead and bringing out the game or bringing out the candles or providing a bit of creativity. And if he'll come with her, right? There's a difference between somebody who rolls their eyes and says, you've got to be kidding. We're going to play what mm -hmm. now? Yep. And somebody who says, oh, we're going to play what now? You're taking me where to do what? And can she be the one who tends to be just a half step ahead on some of the erotic, the imaginative? And can that be just a loveliness about their relationship? He brings this and she brings this. And the question really is more whether he can respond to her bids rather than saying we must be doomed because he's not the one who went and bought a stairs game. This is so important. Mm -hmm. Because the assumption is, if I loved him, if I was in love with him, I would feel X, Y, Z. This is what you just said, that the fact that he's responsive to her bids. Say it again, because I want to frame it. That's the sacred ed piece here that is really essential. Yeah. Well, there's a world of difference. No, no, but say it again. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to underline. <laughs> Go, okay, with a highlighter. What matters is how he responds to her bids. So if she says to herself, but I'm the one that makes the bids and I'm the one with the creative ideas, therefore he must not love me, that story will sink them. Versus when I bring a playful idea or a silly idea, his eyes light up a bit and he will do that for me and with me. That's lovely that you don't have to be the same. I hope that if and when she comes with a bit of novelty or a new way of imagining the same space they've been in, I hope that he will respond. And I hope that she will feel proud that she brought the idea to him rather than disgruntled. Like, here we go again. Why do I have to bring the ideas? Well, because perhaps he brings <laughs> the reliability or he brings the wonderful hug when you get anxious. And this is a he, he, she, she. This is a couple's dynamic. In heterosexual couples, it's sometimes is defined in gender terms, but I really think it's a dynamic. It's a dynamic that you also see when one person initiates sexuality more often. Mm -hmm. the, the sex initiator to other people, you check the responsiveness. That's what really matters. The one who does the cooking, the one who does. The one who does and who wishes that the other person did, rather than the one who does gets to do what they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And did she ever tell him? I really appreciate how much you've been so supportive. I really oh. love it. That in itself brings energy into a relationship. Mm -hmm. That acknowledgement of how important the other is, of how much they mean to you, in how much they enable you to then do what you like to do because they're doing their bid. That's right. And you don't have to think about that part because they're inhabiting that part. So That's every time right. you think, why am I only doing this? You have to put in your mind that you're only doing this because the other parts that you don't do are being done by somebody else too. Yes. Widen out the lens. 
yes, you are the one who initiates sexuality, but they are the one who initiates cooking or who pays the bills. If you widen out and you look at the whole of the relationship across different domains, there may be that one is the initiator and one is the responder. I think when the feeling is I do it all and you don't even notice and there is no appreciation for what I do and there is no acknowledgement for what I do, then the depletion is in course. Yes. If you do, but the other person says, I couldn't do it without you. I'm in awe of you. How do you do all of these things? Rachel Butzman says something very interesting and she talks about trust. And she says that trust in the context of adaptation is not about needing to know more and experiencing more safety. It's actually about being able to tolerate uncertainty. Yes, together. This is the adaptation of the moment. Yeah, beautiful. Esther, I could talk to you for the entire rest of the day, but (laughs) I am going to wind us up. Thank you, listener in the UK. Thank you, thank you for your question because what she's written here, I know you see it in your practice. I see it in my practice. It was a really touching question. And I hope that what we've talked about offers her some direction and some clarity. And I hope that it offers listeners that same thing. So Esther, before you go, you and your team have created a code, Reimagining Love, to receive 10% off of tickets to Sessions Live this year, which is so generous. And I'm so excited that we are doing that. Tell us what you want us to know about kind of next steps for staying connected with you. So Sessions Live, The Great Adaptation, is three Saturdays in November, and it is primarily a professional conference. But if you are interested in those very big questions of the moment, it is for everybody. Because actually what we really try to do is talk in a language that is the language of everyone. Where should we begin and how is work? I bought the podcast that are live couples therapy sessions that I record in my office One time, three hour sessions with anonymous couples, raw, unedited therapy sessions, either with co-workers, colleagues, etc., co-founders, either with romantic partners. And you find them on Spotify or anywhere you listen to your podcast. Where should we begin the card game, the game of stories? You find directly through estherperel.com slash game. And you have been an amazing supporter, actually, on our card game. It is a tool, but it is really coming very handy at a time when many of us have experienced quite a lot of social atrophy. I think that the vault is really estherperel.com. For those of you who are interested, the motto is, I think, something that both you and I share, that the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. And I think both of us are really trying to make sense of the complexities of modern relationships and how we help people navigate them with greater confidence and with heart and mind at the same time. And this is a fascinating time for relationships. Absolutely. We have our work cut out for us and it's fascinating and it's inspiring. And I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for the Reimagining Love Code for Sessions Live for anybody who is a coach, a wellness practitioner, or just a nerdy person who wants to just dive in with Esther and with all of us over those three weekends. Thank you, Esther, so much. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure. Thank you again to Esther for our wonderful conversation. I hope this discussion sparked hope and re-energized you to nurture your most important relationships during this time. You will find the link for the website of Esther's virtual conference, Sessions Live, in our show notes. And don't forget to use the code Reimagining Love at checkout for a discount on your ticket. Reimagining Love is produced by Elizabeth Vogt and edited by Mary Chan and Danelle Cloutier of Organized Sound Productions. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at 